I am glad to have been asked to teach the book of Judges. Although I enjoy teaching Joshua because of the many adventures it details, Judges is also a book with exciting events. Unlike Joshua, however, with verses filled with difficult place names and lists of cities defeated by the Israelites, Judges is an action-packed book with thrilling commentary on almost every page. However, as you have already read it, you know that our enthusiasm for the exploits in the, Bible, in the book was reduced when we realized that this generation of Israelites became so very corrupt in such a short period of time. It is especially sad when we consider that the Israelites in the book of Judges were not more than one or two generations removed from those who traveled with Moses and saw God's great miracles. They were just a few years removed from knowing, firsthand, how God provided victories against overwhelming odds. One writer calls Judges one of the saddest books of the Bible. Whereas Joshua is a book that records history and the faithfulness of God and insights into who God is by what he has done, the writer of Judges presents a book that teaches a lesson of how even the Israelites, who were special in God's eyes, so rapidly deteriorated and incurred God's displeasure. The problem, as you have discovered, is found at the end of the book. Quote, everyone did what was right in his own eyes, Judges 21, 25, and elsewhere. As such, Judges is an important book for our current times, too, because in many parts of the world, Christians find themselves surrounded by a society that has rejected God's standards, and we are saddened by the moral decline we see around us. As I taught in Joshua, I believe Judges to be a factual accounting of the events that occurred as the Israelites entered the Promised Land. It is important to note that unlike Joshua, the author of Judges does not write it to represent a chronological timeline, but rather to illustrate his point, an issue I will discuss in more detail in a few minutes. As in Joshua, I will probably spend a little more time establishing the historicity, geography, and factualness of the events in Judges than you might hear in your studies of other books. And in order for me to present this evidence, I will rely on archaeological information and what is known of the region's history gleaned from many extra-biblical studies. As in the case of Joshua, you should be aware that many commentaries and sources, as well as academicians, do not accept the the accuracy of the Bible's accounts and judges. In fact, I might suggest that the majority of Bible scholars, and I use the word advisably, would urge you to be cautious in accepting the accounts and judges as actually happening as described. As I pointed out in Joshua, it is my objective to help you understand that there is careful research that supports the biblical accounts. Again, time will not allow me to do an exhaustive examination of all the difficulties you will encounter or how to answer the critics. Many books and commentaries and scholars have already done so very well. I only want to encourage you to keep an open mind, and if you have questions, and when you have the time, investigate the issues that trouble you. Finally, I will be ready to assist you as best I am able, if you will contact me. In the same vein, if you have objections to what I present, please feel free to let me know that too. As I did in Joshua, I have developed a complimentary PowerPoint presentation to, to, uh, to assist you in your study. I hope you will have that PowerPoint open on your computer and by your side, as well as your Bible, of course, as you listen to or read the commentary. And again, I would like to point out that many of the pictures, maps, diagrams, and charts are from other sources, sources other than those I have personally made. I have permission to use these. However, that permission does not extend beyond our study here in the field-based SBS. So I would ask you not to copy or transmit the images in the PowerPoint presentation to any publications. You are certainly welcome to use them in Christian teaching, such as Sunday schools and YWAM classes. But I ask you not to violate the agreement I have made with the field-based SBS staff or the permissions of the authors and owners of the images. If you have questions about this, contact me or the field-based SBS staff. Now open the PowerPoint presentation that goes with this lesson 
and click on the first slide after the introduction that would be slide number two. It is called Background of Judges. As you can read, the title of the book is found in the Hebrew name for leaders, Shaftim, which comes from a verb to judge. But in this book, it has an added meaning, that of service as a leader. Thus, the judges in this book not only performed civic functions that we might consider in the peer purview of an administrator, but also military leadership. Note that these functions were exercised under God's authority, and we only find judges like these in the time of judges, and that includes the books of Jude, Ruth and the opening chapters of 1 Samuel. As the second bullet implies, the time of the judges continues into the book of 1 Samuel since Eli or Eli and Samuel in that book are also considered to be judges. I believe the book of Judges is placed so that it establishes a link in the history between Joshua and Samuel. As the book of Joshua opened with the death of Moses, so the book of Judges opens with the death of Joshua. Each death marked the end of an era, the wilderness march in one era and the wars of conquest in the other. But unlike at the time of the death of Joshua, there was no designated leader to be found in the opening verses of Judges. However, the attempt to occupy the conquered territories that began in Joshua and continued after Joshua's death, as noted in Judges 1.1. There the people ask, Who shall go up first for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? The term Canaanites is used in a broad, generic sense here to describe all the people on the land west of the Jordan River. The answer to the question, who shall go up first, is not given in the name of a person, but is implied to mean that it is the various tribes' responsibility, guided by God, to occupy the remaining land. Before continuing with the story of Judges, let's examine a few more background matters. Turn to the next PowerPoint slide, that's number three, background continued, and the date of the writing. Here is where things become unclear. As this slide explains, there is internal evidence that the book was written in the time of David, probably before David conquered Jebus, which is also known as Jerusalem. Since you have read Judges, you may have come to that same conclusion. But there is another, a more important thing to note, perhaps. The book is obviously not in chronological order. In other words, it is clear that chapters 17 through 21 are not immediately before the time of Eli of the next book, 1 Samuel, but rather the events are appear to have occurred immediately after the time of Joshua. And this brings me to a very important point. In my teaching of Joshua, I explained that people who live in the culture of the Middle East frequently describe things and events by their function, not by their form or how they look. For example, if I were to ask someone from a Western, say European or North American culture, to describe a ballpoint pen, he or she would say the pen is six inches long, red with a point, etc. However, if I were to ask someone from an Arab culture, he or she might say it was an instrument for writing. That is the difference between form and function. You can see this in the beautiful Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32, with the repeated use of the term rock. For someone from the Middle East culture, they would probably think of a rock by its use or function. That is, rocks provide shade, protection, form the foundations of homes, and so on. I, on the other hand, would think of a rock by its form, that is, large, dark, hard, etc. Now in Judges we see this happening as the author recited to the reader the function of the stories of how the Israelites fell deeper and deeper into sin. By the time the reader gets to chapter 17 and following, it is clear that the Israelites were so debased and displeasing to God, we wonder how they ever survived as a nation. So in Judges, the author described the function of how Israel sinned, not its form or what it looked like or its chronological order. 
I have often read that Israel sends cries for help and God's deliverance by judges was cyclical. While that is true, it's more important to note that each cycle the book describes took the Israelites farther and farther down the path towards destruction. And by the time the book ends, we are disgusted with the Israelites and surprised that God will continue to love such an unlovable people. Hmm, is there a parable on a parallel to that in our own lives? The next point on the same PowerPoint slide is authorship. Like many of the Old Testament books, this is an anonymously written book. However, from the context of the book, it appears to have been written in the time of Samuel, either by Samuel or a contemporary of his. Turn now to the next PowerPoint slide, that's number four. Here I have given you what I believe to be the purpose of the book. However, you may have your own ideas, and if so, that's wonderful. The following bullet on the slide, Place in History, is a vital point and introduces the issue of the time period the book covers. I am often amazed at how little Bible students and theologians know about the book of Judges. They are familiar with some of the stories, but do not understand its place in Israel's history. You may remember that in my teaching of Joshua, I took considerable time to establish the Exodus as being about 1446 B.C., that's called the early Exodus date, with the conquest beginning about 40 years later, or 1406 B.C. If you're not familiar with how I arrived at those dates, you may want to go back and review the Joshua lesson. But if you accept my arguments then, as I have pointed out on this slide, the book of Judges covers about 340 years of Israel's Old Testament history, that is, from about 1390 B.C., which is the estimated date of the death of Joshua, to the beginning of the monarchy under King Saul in 1050 B.C. If you stop to consider that 340 years is almost one-third of the total history of Israel in the Promised Land, you can understand why I believe Judges is such an important book. Turn now to the next PowerPoint slide. That's number five, called Background Continued. It discusses a problem that has troubled scholars. If you add all the periods of time in the book of Judges, that is, from the death of Joshua to the death of Samson, the book records about 410 years of history. If we add another five years to arrive at the start of Saul's reign in 1050 B.C., as recorded in 1 Samuel, that makes 415 years. But yet the actual chronological time, as I just stated, is 340 years. Well, how do we account for the 75-year difference? As I described on the PowerPoint slide, the book gives us a clue. There is clearly some overlapping of parts of judges. In other words, some judges may have judged at the same time in different parts of the country. It is apparent as you read the accounts of the various judges that they judged in specific parts of the country <coughs> to solve the problem related to a specific tribe or tribes. Thus, it would have been possible for judges to have lived and performed their duties simultaneously. This can especially be discerned in chapter 10, verse 7, where it appears the Ammonite oppression, resolved by Jephthah, and the Philistine occupation, met by Samson, obviously overlapped. And be aware of my last comment on that slide, that we shouldn't let our concern for form, that is chronological dating, override the author's purpose of showing us the function of those events. Turn now to the next PowerPoint slide, that's number six, background continued. Scholars often categorize the judges into two groups, major and minor. I personally don't care for that differentiation since I believe all the judges were important. Well, be that as it may, there are six judges in each group of the book of Judges. However, we should add Eli and Samuel as major judges from 1 Samuel, men who I previously mentioned. They are also considered to be judges. That makes for a total of eight major judges in both books. The criterion for scholars separating them into these categories is explained in the bottom part of the slide. As you have already learned from your reading, a few of the judges are mentioned in only one or two verses. Thus, obviously, that places them in the minor judge category. 
On the next slide, that's number seven, I have presented what I believe to be the theme of Judges. I discussed at some length in the teaching of Joshua the word mutiny, and that's what I believe more accurately describes what we do, and Israelites were doing when we go against God's will. The mutiny theme is found in uh, chapter 17, verse 6, and is echoed again in ver- chapter 21, 25. In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. And I think that correctly portrays what is meant by mutiny. In addition, it might be well to remember that these judges were not God's design. Judges had wanted, uh, God rather, had wanted Israel to be a theocracy where God would be the supreme ruler. Israel wasn't to be a democracy where people ruled or a monarchy where an earthly king would dominate. Instead, Israel would be ruled by God and it was to set an example for all the nations. It was to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation as described in Exodus chapter 19 verse 6. But the book of Judges clearly shows the people forfeited the blessings of this highest form of government. And in 1 Samuel, they ultimately demand Samuel appoint an earthly king so that they could have, quote, a king for us to judge us like all the nations. That's in 1 Samuel 8, 5. On the next PowerPoint slide, that's number eight, I have listed some of the indicators that support the theme, mutiny against God. I am sure you can add more to the list. I am always shocked at how quickly the Israelites turned to worshiping other idols, and I suspect you were too. After repeated warnings in Deuteronomy and elsewhere, the Israelites certainly knew better. Surely the author of Judges was appalled by what he had seen and heard, and so he selected stories to make his point about the level of degradation reached by the people of Israel. So the reader, by the time the book concludes, must have been thoroughly disgusted. On the next slide, number nine, I have listed the blessings of the generation of Joshua so that you can contrast those with the conditions presented by the generation found in Judges. Those contrasts are quite startling, considering how close each of these generations were to each other. Why, we might ask, would the people of Israel sink so low so fast. Perhaps an explanation can be seen in the next PowerPoint slide, number 10. Why would Israel worship idols? I have contrasted here what is required when we worship the one true God of Israel as opposed to worshiping idols. It seems to me this list is almost timeless. Today we have people worshiping various idols such as money, easy living, acceptance of immoral lifestyles, compromising scripture on the altar of convenience, and so on. I would ask that you pause and contemplate this chart, reflecting on what it means to worship our God, praying that we not be like the Israelites in the time of Judges, but hold to what we know is true, understanding when we do so, we're going to go against the general flow of the world. The next slide, number 11, is an outline of the book of Judges, and it's my straightforward outline of the book. You, of course, have done more rigorous charting. But perhaps this simple overview is where you will find the three main sections, and this will be helpful as we begin to open the book's pages. With that introduction to the book, let us now turn to chapter 1 of Judges. The opening verse is interesting. The question the people ask, Who shall go up first for us? against the Canaanites to fight against them. It shows how the people were relying on human leaders, like Joshua, to lead them against the Canaanites. However, as I said previously, there was no one leader. It was up to the individual tribes to occupy their land. Chapter 1 reports that initially, Judah and Simeon had some success in their military campaigns. They won a victory at Bezek, thought to be a city near Jerusalem, and they captured the leader of the city, Adonai Bezek, in the process. <coughs> I find it uncomfortable to read how the Israelites mutilated Adonai Bezek, presumably to render him unable to fight or for royal service. Next, the Judites conquered Jerusalem. 
This is interesting since Jerusalem was in the tribal allocation of Benjamin. However, Jerusalem controlled the road system that provided the Judites access to the Jordan Valley, and presumably they wanted to remove Jerusalem as an obstacle from their path. Look at the map on the next PowerPoint slide, that's number 12, and you will see what I mean. Judah controlled the area immediately south of Jerusalem and the road to the Jordan Valley that went around Jerusalem. Benjamin, on the other hand, had access to the Jordan Valley through an east-west road that went from Bethel to Jericho. Thus, if Judah or Simeon needed to trade to the east, they either had to go south of the Dead Sea or go past Jerusalem. Therefore, I assume Judah conquered Jerusalem in order to secure their trade access to the east side of the Jordan Valley. Unfortunately, in verse 21 of chapter 1, it is reported that they soon lost control of Jerusalem. Later, you will learn that Jerusalem did not become a permanent possession of Israel until the time of King David, about 1000 B.C., and that happens in 2 Samuel chapter 5. Next, the Judites and their allies went south and conquered Hebron and defeated three men whose names are Sheshai, Aiman, and Talmai. Although we might be inclined to skip over these names, we should consider who they are and why the author listed them. If you did your research, you should have found these same men listed in Numbers chapter 13, verse 22, where they are called the descendants of Anak, the people of great size, who lived in Hebron. The importance of their defeat is mentioned again when Caleb is given Hebron in Judges verse 20, chapter 1. Caleb, who you learned in Joshua, had to remove the descendants of Anak, and in that verse they are referred to as the descendants of the same three men. Therefore, this account is a continuation of the story in Joshua 14, where Caleb was awarded Hebron for his service during the conquest. Success continued as the Judites captured Debir, or Kiriath Sefer. Caleb, who controlled this region, offered his daughter Aksa as a wife to anyone who attacked the city. Othniel, son of Canaz, Caleb's younger brother, accepted the challenge and took the city. Aksa then asked her father for the springs that fed water to the area. The spring's names are roughly translated to mean upper and lower wells. Interestingly, archaeologists have excavated a site named Rabud that they believe to be Debir. It is close to Hebron, was occupied at the correct time, and interestingly, there are two ancient wells near the site with the names, even today, of the upper and lower wells. In contemporary times, these wells overflowed in the springtime. Again, we find a case where archaeology has confirmed information in the Bible. Verse 16 tells us that the Kenite descendants of Moses' father-in-law moved from Jericho, here referred to as the City of Palms, to a location in the southern part of Judah's allocation. There they lived with the Judites. The success of the Judites continued with the tribe and its allies taking Zephah, also called Hormoth, Gaza, Ashkelon, Ekron, and the hill country. Wow, this encouraging report concludes in the first part of verse 19 with the statement that the Lord was with Judah. But, and there is a but in the middle of the verse, and anywhere we find a but in scripture, it usually signals a change, and the change here is a warning of what was to come, for as the Bible says, the Judites and their allies could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain because they had chariots of iron. And on that ominous note, we will leave our study for now, and we'll return to the story in our next lesson.